no more of it. I, I don't mean to be insubordinate, sir. It's just that... It's just the what? Speak up. With due respect to your uniform, sir, I cannot answer without subjecting myself to further disciplinary action. You what? Lieutenant, you've got me curious. So curious that I'm going to give you a chance to say what's on your mind. Stand loose, Mullins. We're putting military protocol aside until we get this settled. As you wish. I have heard you've been holding group religious talks with the men. That's, that's true. Does this have anything to do with what ails you? Are you some sort of a, a frustrated preacher? That's exactly what I am. You mean a real one? I was ordained two months before accepting my commission. You know this doesn't make any sense, don't you? I didn't think it would. Do you? All right. Speak your piece. Let's have it. You are a heathen, Major Gaston. A ruthless barbarian who delights in killing. In my opinion, you are a discredit to your uniform and to the flag which you pretend to serve. Please go on. You are the principal reason for my frustration. You've given me little hope of ever accomplishing what I... what I came here to do. But this is not my... my first frustration. That's, uh, that was in Washington when my attempt to be designated as a chaplain assigned to the army was refused. A preacher? Part of the army? I can't think of any spot on this earth, Major, where one is more needed than in places like this, where hate and kill are the order of the day, every day. And you actually believe the Indian can be defeated with the Bible? The Indian is already defeated, Major Gaston. He is only retaliating against inhuman attempts to exterminate him. And until people like you, and subsequently the men serving under you, can be influenced by... until your attitudes of hate can be changed to one of love, there will be no end to this bloodshed. There will be no end to this bloodshed as long as there is any blood in the murderous hides of these redskins. Now you called what I did today a massacre. Just where do you think I learned about such things? Not from my father, not from my mother, not from my two sisters or my brother, or from any of the 57 other people who lived in the settlement where I was born. Because I was the only one left alive, and the Modocs were through with us. You talk to me about brotherly love. My father was still talking about it when they scalped him. And I have a surprise for you, Lieutenant. Like you, he was a preacher. Now I can understand why you feel as you do. Can you really, Mullins? Well, you'd better understand this, too. You're beating your head up against something even harder when you wave your Bible around here. I'm well aware of that. I'm glad you are. Because I'll be more than happy to endorse your letter of request for transfer. I didn't say I was going to quit. Then I'll say it for you. Because if you stay in my command, you'll learn that the United States Army Manual is the only Bible we use. The flag you pretend to serve, Major, stands for many things. Among them, the right of free worship. The interview is over, Lieutenant. Dismissed. Why don't you let me come along, Duke? I can help you load the supplies. The last time he went to help me, the only thing he got loaded was himself. You stay out of this, Hawks. Who'll do your work if you go with him? What's the matter with Hawks doing? He's always complaining about my cooking, making him sick, ain't he? <laughs> you know, Chris, that might give us a chance to get our health back at that. If he doesn't lose his in that post saloon. I promise you, Mr. Chris, I won't go near a saloon. Not even once, no, sir. I guess Clarence wouldn't mind putting up with two of us for a few days. Good, good, good. <laughs> Look out, Hawks. Come and drive, Duke. 
Well, goodbye. <laughs> You know, Chris, I got a picture of that old goat staying out of the saloon. Well, that's Duke's worry now. You know, Duke, the only promise I made, I wouldn't win the saloon. I didn't say I wouldn't take a little nip. You know the way I figured it? Any friend of yours is a friend of mine. We get to his house, he'll bring out his private stock, and we'll have a little nip, you know. <laughs> well, there's only two things wrong with that, Charlie. What's that? Clarence Mullins doesn't live in a house, and he doesn't have any private stock. He's a preacher. Preacher. Spend so much time in Fort Willoughby, it's almost like home. I'd like to cut my visit short. I don't be bitter, Charlie. Besides, you're about to meet quite a man. I am. when Clarence gets off duty. What's a preacher doing in the Army, anyhow? Preaching? I'm sorry, but you know you ain't gonna see it today, either. Why don't you just give up, old-timer? The Major, he ain't never gonna change his mind. I can tell you that. Better come back tomorrow. Harvey Mullins? Is that you, Mr. Mullins? I sure am glad to see you, sir. Oh, my boy, my boy. Just this minute rode in. You were going to be my second stop just as soon as I checked on Clarence. You just don't know what your coming here means. Oh, I can't stay very long. That's why I wanted Clarence to know I was here as soon as possible. He is here, isn't he? Something's happened to him, hasn't it? If you're looking for Lieutenant Mullins, mister, he ain't around anymore. He got drummed out of the Army uh, about a year ago. Drummed out? Yes, sir, drummed out. Duke, you were his best friend. You know as well as anybody just how stubborn he could be. Right from the very start, he didn't hit it off with Peter Gaston. Gaston felt that, well, he might influence his troopers. Clarence's Bible might make them soft, so we got rid of him. Every time Clarence voiced his objection to Gaston's treatment of the Modocs, he was punished for insubordination. Finally, he was thrown out. Didn't he make an appeal? The army didn't agree with his ideas of assigning chaplains to frontier posts in the first place. And Duke, that didn't stop him from coming here. And Major Gaston hasn't stopped him either. You know where he is? I only know he promised God he'd devote his life in ending man's inhumanity to man. He said, when I find only deaf ears on one side, I have no choice but to try the other. Modocs? Nothing I could say stopped him from going into the Modoc country. But he said that he wouldn't return until Indians and white agreed to live as brothers. You were right when you said he was stubborn. Modoc country is out of bounds to the white man. Didn't Gaston try and stop him? I begged him to. But he wouldn't even see me after I first talked to him. And every day since then, I've come here to beg him to go after my son, to see if he was all right. And every single day, he'd leave orders here, not to let me in. Well, he'll let me in. You wait here. Duke. Hey, halt! some important reason for bursting in here. I'm sure you're familiar with the military custom of being announced. It's another custom at this post I'm interested in. What about not letting people into Modoc country? And what about it? Why was Clarence Mullins the exception? I recall warning him against that several times. You could have stopped him like you have others. Mm, I don't know about that. I never did have much luck at stopping him at anything. So you could have gone after him? Yes, I could have. Then why didn't you? Because I didn't consider the life of one man worth getting a whole scouting party killed. Particularly the life of that man. All right, Shannon. I won't deny that I was glad to be rid of him. But that isn't why I didn't go after him. 
The Modocs had been on a rampage about that time. It hadn't been long since they murdered Colonel Banks. He made the mistake of thinking he could get them to sign a treaty. He was on a peace mission, and he and his entire party were ambushed. So what chance did my scouts have of finding Mullins and even getting back alive? You just rode through your compound out there, and all your men looked pretty relaxed. They didn't look at all like troopers that had been fighting Indians lately, or even expected to. That's true enough. There hasn't been enough rising in over three months. Well, how do you account for that? How do you account for anything a MODOC does, especially the way they torture? Besides, Mullins couldn't possibly be alive. Maybe he could. How do you know they didn't let him live? How do you know they didn't listen to what he had to say? Don't be ridiculous. If they didn't kill him on sight, they'd have tortured him until he died. They weren't always like that. Clarence and I found out not too many years ago that Indians weren't quite as different as grown-ups had always told us. I guess he never forgot it. Thanks for your time, Major. Shannon, if you're planning to go after Mullins, don't bother. I'm taking my troops up to the timber myself in the morning. Why, are you getting bored with no fighting? My orders are to clear a road through the Modoc timber. It'll shorten our supply route by 30 miles. The party I'm taking up there is a work party. But you will be carrying guns, won't you? Naturally. You need them if you go cutting a right away through their land. That timber the Modocs are occupying will be their land when and if they sign a treaty with the United States government and when it's given to them. Until that time, it belongs to the best fighting outfit. That's the way it's been from one end of this country to the other. And that's the way it is here. Good day, Mr. Shannon. <laughs> You didn't tell me this timber was a two-day ride from the fort. How long do you think we can stay away from the train? As long as it takes to find Clarence and get him back to the fort where he belongs. If he's still alive. Still alive, he won't have much chance staying that way after the Major's troops get there. He'll be right in the middle of another war. But I told you before, you don't have to go with me if you don't want to. Well, I don't want to. Then don't. I didn't say I wasn't going. I said I didn't want to. You think I let a friend down, Duke? You think I can? No, you're as foolish as I am. Come on, let's go. Ride through timber like this for a year and never see an Indian. Well, keep your voice down, Charlie. They'll hear you. Ooh, what? I don't see anybody. They've been following and watching us for the past five hours. You sure? Look at that, Duke. Fine scouts you are. Them moccasin tracks are headed up that hill just as sure as anything. Well, that's what's wrong with them. They're trying to lead us off the trail. They wouldn't be doing that if we weren't headed in the right direction. If they wanted to capture us, why didn't they attack us a long time ago? I'm not sure, Charlie. Maybe it's for the same reason they haven't been fighting the cavalry lately. Come on, Duke, have a heart. Let's rest a while. I'm not a young you, you know. Even if I do look like it. All right. Not for long. Charlie. Not yet, Duke. We've only been here a minute. Rest. Open your eyes, Charlie. we got company. Charlie, what? 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 Point is, we're both hearing him. What's that mean? Because these Indians haven't got any reason to stay hidden. Let's go. Yeah. This is a most happy occasion for me because this man was like a brother to me through all my growing up years. It was his great capacity for friendship that brought him in search of me because he thought I might be 
in danger. I am as grateful for that friendship as I am for the fact that he is to learn there is no danger here for any man who comes offering the hand of brotherhood. His name is Duke Shannon, and his companion's name is Charles Wooster. This is the chief of the Modocs, also my friend, Jeremiah. Jeremiah? The name he took when he accepted Christianity and was baptized. These are Jeremiah's subchiefs, Ezekiel and Obadiah. Glad to know your chief ships. We go now. Prepare welcome for a new friend. That was my father, Duke. You, you did see him, didn't you? I saw him, Clarence. But I hardly recognized him at first. Worrying over you has made an old man of him. Such a nice old fellow, too. You should have let him know where you're going. No, I haven't been fair to him, but I... I couldn't possibly have left here. And if I'd sent an Indian messenger, the Major would have seen to it that he didn't come back alive. You're not going to escape Major Gaston anyway, Clarence. By some time tomorrow morning, he'll have a full force of men at the edge of the timber. He's been ordered to cut a new road through here. And I wouldn't put it past him to use it as an excuse to start the war up again. He hasn't changed a bit. A few months ago, that would have disturbed me, but now... it may be the answer to a prayer. Didn't you understand me? I said he hasn't changed. Maybe not, but the Modocs have. It takes two sides to make a war, Duke. And the Indians are no longer hostile. They want peace. What if Gaston won't let him have it? I think he will. I think he will after I talk with him. And I'm glad you're here to help me, Duke. You can take me to him tomorrow, first thing in the morning. Stay away from him, Clarence. How can we ever solve our problems, Duke? By, by avoiding them. Friendship is like... It's like truth. If we keep it hidden, it becomes something else, less desirable. All right. I'll admit you've made progress here, but you can't rush it. You've got to give things a chance to take their natural course. The natural course, Duke, was war. The Lord has seen fit to allow me to put a stop to that. Now he is sending Major Gaston to me that I might bring brother, together with brother, in the light of his word. My father has sent me to tell you that quarters have been prepared for you and that he is waiting for you to come and smoke the pipe of friendship. Thank you. This is Esther, daughter of the chief, Jeremiah. Glad to meet you, Esther. And you tell your father we'll be along shortly. Whew. You know, Duke, I think the Reverend's right. There's nothing like friendship, among people, that is. <laughs> Major Gaston, Duke Shannon wants to see him. Duke Shannon! I knew you'd be glad to see me again, Major. I thought I told you not to come here. What if I told you I had evidence Clarence Mullins is still alive? I wouldn't believe you. What if I could prove it? The only proof I'll believe is to see the former lieutenant... ...himself. How nice to see you again, Major. Well... I wouldn't have recognized you with that beard. <laughs> a beard on the face of a messenger of the Lord in the wilderness is not uncommon, Major. You'd know that if you read the Bible. I didn't come all this way just to have you preach at me again. <laughs> no, no, no preaching, Major, I promise. I, uh, I came to apologize to you. Me? Do you forget who broke you out of the army? I might even thank you for that. You haven't changed in one respect. You're still not making any sense. And the bit I didn't once. I said some unjust things to you. And I'm sorry. But I've come to realize some important truths this past year. Actually, uh, you and I have much in common. Really? We're both dedicated to our work, and we both take our orders from a superior whose goals are the same. Ultimate peace. We just go about it differently. Mullins, what are you driving at? How would you like to be the man who effected a treaty with the Modocs? Like Colonel Banks did, with an arrow through his chest? You tell him, Duke. The Modocs want peace. That's why you haven't had a brush with them in the last three months. Clarence converted them all to Christianity. That's the truth, Major. 
Sir, Duke and me saw it with our own eyes. <laughs> and who are you? Another bearded messenger in the wilderness? Me? Oh, I'm with him. And I stand with Clarence in this matter. And I'm not with anyone who asks me to trust a Modoc. They're willing to trust you, Major. Can they? What do you mean by that? I've given them assurance you won't attack without reason. Did I tell the truth? I came here to clear trees for a road. But if they try to stop me... They won't. They won't hinder you. They have learned that giving is a demonstration of friendship. If there's going to be any fighting. You'll have to fire the first shot. I said I came to build a road. That's all. Is that a promise? I don't have to answer to you, Shannon. Well, that's right, Major. You don't. But I don't think Washington would be very pleased to find out that you are perpetrating the war that Colonel Banks lost his life trying to stop. And they'll know it, I promise you that. I don't think threats are necessary, Duke. The Major has given us assurance of his sole purpose here. And I happen to know the Major's a man of his word. All right, Mullins. You've made your point. But you tell your Indians if they make one wrong move, it'll be their last. I'll do that. And what are you going to tell your men? I'll talk to them. You have my word. If you will, show the Modocs a little good faith. You'll have that treaty signed before you know it. Uh, gentlemen, I'm, uh, I'm holding religious services at the Indian Meeting House, and I'll appreciate if you'll pass the word. I, I'm sure there are some who will be interested. We'll mark our trail so the Meeting House will be easy to find. Services are held every night at, at sundown. Realize what you just did? I have just planted the seeds of brotherhood. You've just planted trouble. You can't let those troopers mingle with your Indians. Look at it this way, Duke. The only ones who will accept the invitation will be those of good Christian intent in the first place. Now, what better messengers of peace and goodwill could there be to combat suspicion and hate? Just exactly the kind of communication I need if I'm to... Well, if I'm to bring everlasting peace to this country. I think we ought to go back to the train. Not just yet. Why not? We've done everything we come here to do. We found him, and he ain't about to go back with us. You know that. I think he's going to need us now more than ever. I don't believe I remember you. I'm Barker. I was uh, with, I guess I was with Major Gaston Unit after you'd, uh, well, after you'd left. I can't tell you how, how glad I am you decided to visit us. Thanks, Reverend. I'm sorry there aren't, there aren't more of you. <laughs> I'd appreciate if you'd stay a while after services and meet my Modoc friends here. I was planning on that, Reverend. I have always promised you that in our belief in the word of the Lord, there is a common meeting ground for all, for all peoples, a place where 
all can come together with a common interest. I am pleased that it has come to pass. Tonight, I am proud to welcome a trooper who, after a hard day at his labor, has traveled a long distance to share with us a common interest. Come right on in, gentlemen. You are most welcome. This is just the beginning, my friends. The beginning of peace and goodwill among both peoples. Let us be proud and grateful that we are the ones chosen to give meaning to his promise. And tonight, after the services, let's all show our visitors how welcome they are. You can't be serious about this, Clarence. Of course I'm serious. Didn't you think I was? I was sure hoping you weren't. I don't understand you, Duke. You've been trying to throw cold water on me ever since you got here. Not until you got this ridiculous idea of trying to turn blood enemies into intimate friends overnight. Up to that point, I was with you 100%. Oh, come on, Duke. You can see for yourself it's working. Look at the, look at the turnout tonight. What do you think they turned out? To hear you preach? That's why they were invited, wasn't it? Oh, brother. You explain it to him, Charlie. Who, me? Tell him. Well, I've been watching them troopers, and they seem to be more interested in looking at them pretty young Indian girls and listening to what you're saying. Maybe you only saw what you wanted to see, Charlie. No, no. I never want to see something that causes trouble. But I spent a hitch in the army myself, and I know what interests them young bucks when they're stuck out in the middle of nowhere. And it certainly ain't preaching either. Where have you been since the last time I saw you, Clarence? What have you been doing? Haven't you looked up from your Bible long enough to see any of the things going on around you? I look for the good in people, not the evil. But the evil's there. You can't make it go away by shutting your eyes to it. The only evil here is in your minds. I... Sorry I had to say that. I always considered you my best friend. But I'm thinking now it might be better if you left. Well, I'm not leaving because I've always considered you my best friend. Otherwise, I wouldn't care if you made a fool of yourself. Just don't make the mistake of trying to stop me. I feel sorry for you, Duke. For two cents, I would pull out of here. Would you sell it for a whole nickel? Here.
been almost an hour since them troopers rode into town tonight. I wonder what's keeping the people from the services. I think you just answered your own question, Charlie. Uh, Claire, I, I never heard of a minister leaving his congregation before the services. My congregation is out there. Well, you only cause trouble if you go out there. You cause trouble. The word of God caused trouble. But those who don't want to hear it, yes. Maybe there's nothing wrong. Them troopers behaved all right last night. Last night they were still laying the groundwork. <laughs> you men know better than to bring liquor here. Jeremiah, don't drink any more of it. You teach us be friends with soldier. That's what we do. Drinking liquor is evil. Tastes fine. Make head feel good. Mmm, not evil. I forbid it. You not forbid Jeremiah. I cheat. <laughs> You've got to do something about this. About what? All this liquor here, you've got to get it out of here. And this pairing off with the girls. Don't think I don't know what you're up to. Oh, fool. Now, Reverend, where did you learn that? What are you men trying to do to me? Just trying to accept your hospitality. That's what we're trying to do. You were invited here to attend services. You came last night and the night before. Services are held every night in that meeting place. Now, Reverend. Don't let us stop you. Now, you go right on. Go ahead. Let it go for now, Clarence. You can clear it up in the morning. You stay out of it, Duke. They were invited here to attend services. That's what they're going to do. Tonight, we shall concern ourselves with the perplexity of the prophet who, upon finding himself in the midst of evil, could not understand why God remained silent and permitted it. All right, preacher, the meeting house is over there. I shall first read to you from the Old Testament. The first chapter of Habakkuk, verses 1 through 4. The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. O Lord! How long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. You hear me, preacher? I said, go read your Bible someplace else. Voice of Jehovah answered the prophet. Behold ye among the heathen, and regard, and wonder marvelously, for I will... <laughs> for I will work a work in your days, which ye will not believe, though it be told you. Shut up. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. <laughs> I warned you. We will let him get by with that. Clarence can handle three like Barker if he wants to. No, you're not home, Reverend. Oh. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Get this through your head, preacher. I ain't gonna let you spoil our good times. Stay out of it. <clears throat> now pick up the Bible. Crawl, mister.
it to the minister. Your sidearms will be turned over to Major Gaston in the morning. You know where your horses are. Get on them. You not come back again. Sorry this happened, Clarence. Why did you interfere? You weren't even defending yourself. I was defending myself in my own way. One of my flock had been returned to me, and there would have been others if you had stayed out of it. But that soldier was... He was showing himself in his true light. You extinguished that light, and I do not thank you for it. Charlie, let's get out of here. daughter walked to edge a village to be alone with thoughts she not come back this morning braves look for her find her in forest death <laughs> See the major. Major's busy talking to some men. We'll wait. I don't think he wants to see you anyway. He'll see us if he wants these. What are you doing with army property? We took them away from some of your buddies who might have gotten careless with them. Like you're doing with yours. You got a lot of guts coming up here. Just keeping my word. All right, we'll take our guns now. You'll take them when the major says so. The major says so. Parker, I thought you said Shannon gave your guns to the Indians. That's what it looked like to us, sir. He's a liar. He knew we were bringing them guns back this morning. Duke told him that. I'm afraid Barker isn't quite honest in everything he says or does. Not much of a fighter, either. <laughs> you men could be in a lot of trouble attacking United States Army soldiers in defense of the enemy. He must have told you quite a story. Do you deny it? Unless you consider Reverend Mullins an enemy. Mullins? I knew that preacher had caused trouble sooner or later. Maybe you'd better ask Barker exactly how it all happened again. I'll question my own men in my own way. I've had about enough interference from civilians, preachers or otherwise. Well, you won't have any more with us. We're heading back to the train. Yeah, Clarence is mad at us. Hmm. He won't listen to you either, eh? It appears to me that nobody listens to anybody around here. But I'm going to say one more thing before I go. If you don't keep your men out of that Indian village, you're going to be responsible for starting another war. You're absolutely right. And that's why I've already issued an order putting an end to this nonsense. What? Yes, I allowed it only so long as there was no trouble. Duke, I told you I came here to build a road, not fight a war. But maybe you don't listen very well either. What's the matter, Clarence? Could it really be true? 
are you talking about? You pretended to be a Christian. So you could know the girl, Esther. You deceived me and brought evil to my people. Could it be that you are capable of murder, too? The only thing about any murder was your desire for vengeance so great that you would actually kill an innocent girl. What girl? What are you trying to do to me? All right, Mullins, say what's on your mind. Esther, the daughter of Jeremiah. The girl who came to my defense. When Barker hit me, was found in the woods this morning, dead. This man is simply a product of your own godless influence. Now, don't try to put this on my back, preacher. This is directly a result of your own stupid obsession to cram your faith down the throat of the world. Drop that gun. What's got into you? I, I, I didn't mean to do that, Duke. You meant it. You meant it for a long time before you did it. You warned me not to interfere. Well, I think you're the meddler. You're the one who insisted on bringing the whites and the Indians together before they were ready. You're the one who set himself up as judge and jury. Well, how do you judge yourself, Clarence? Esther's dead. Does God forgive you no matter what you do? Clarence, I... What do you know about this? Are you going to tell me what happened, Barker, or must I find out my own way? It was an accident, sir. I didn't realize I'd hit her so hard, and I told her to stop screaming. She wouldn't listen to me. I had to hit her. Lambert? Yes, sir. Take charge of the prisoner. Yes, sir. Pretty rough on him. Clarence, I don't feel sorry for me, Duke. You were right. The burden is mine. Alone. And I think I have the strength to bear it. What will you do? I don't know. Jeremiah swore vengeance on the white man all over again. They've already deserted the village. My people have left me, Duke. I'll have to go after them. Start all over again. They're not your people, Mullins. We are. Sail there, too. You seem willing to start over with the Modocs. Why not with us? What are you saying? You've convinced me of one thing. It takes two sides to make a war, and two sides to make a friend. Perhaps our side could use some of your philosophy. Now, I'm the one who took your rank away. I can give it back if I want to. Major, I'm not sure I'm interested in rank. If you're in my outfit, you'll have rank. I'm still running a military establishment. Your job will be to provide religious leadership, but only for those who want it. Is that clear? Yes, sir. And don't try to force any of it on me. No, sir. As my father used to say, God's truth is ever-present in all things for all men to experience, each man in his own way. Yes, Major. This time, I really do understand. <laughs> <laughs> 